Hi everyone, my name is Rosalina Jowers and I'm the Social Impact Communications Manager at Participant, the leading media company dedicated to entertainment that inspires audiences to engage in positive social change. For this year's annual legislative conference, we're thrilled to share clips and a discussion about the documentary we helped produce about the legacy and impact of the late Congressman John Lewis. Before we talk more about the film and introduce you to our panelists, I'd like to share a little bit more about Participant. Participant was founded 16 years ago with a core belief that a good story well told can change the world. And our work has been rooted at the intersection of arts and activism ever since. We work with world-class artists who foresee the most pressing issues of our time and partner with amazing advocates and organizations that have dedicated their lives to making the world a more fair, sustainable and equitable place. We believe that it's only through our partnerships that we can accelerate change. This brief reel will help introduce you to Participant. to choose whether to be silent or to stand up. So don't act like you're not powerful. Like you don't have a voice. It takes courage to change people's hearts. Don't act like you need permission. It is right to give hope to the future generation. In the context of this work and the ways in which we've seen core tenets of our democratic institutions challenge, we've released a slate of films, including John Lewis Good Trouble, and designed impact campaigns that inspire, empower, and connect our audience to engage more deeply with our democracy. As we know, fewer than 56% of eligible voters turned out to vote for the last presidential election. Partisan gerrymandering, which is the topic of our documentary Slay the Dragon, is undermining fair representation. Voter suppression tactics, which the documentary John Lewis Good Trouble covers, are on the rise. That's why we developed Participants Vote, a get out the vote and vote by mail effort to help voters navigate the ever-changing voting landscape ahead of the November election. As part of this effort, earlier this year, we launched the Good Trouble campaign in partnership with our film partners and impact organizations. Inspired by the legacy of Congressman John Lewis, the Good Trouble campaign is focusing on civic engagement efforts that address and empower disenfranchised communities to fully participate in our democracy. Thus far, the campaign has held nearly 60 virtual screenings and sent more than 13,000 voter registration forms to eligible voters across the US. To learn more, you can visit participantsvote.com and makegoodtrouble.com. And now time to get into John Lewis Good Trouble. John Lewis Good Trouble tells the story of Congressman Lewis, an American hero who spent his life fighting for voting rights and racial justice. He fought alongside Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during the Civil Rights Movement and helped get the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965. By refusing to give up the fight for racial justice, equality, and voting rights, Congressman Lewis is the embodiment of what it means to do the right thing, no matter what. As he put it, making good trouble. 
Today, we're happy to share two clips from the film. The Monday after Bloody Sunday, after we were beaten in Selma, Dr. King came to my hospital bedside and said, John, don't worry. I issued a call for religious leaders to come. The events of Selma had been brought to a climax by a nighttime attack on a white Boston minister by white men. He died two days later. President Lyndon Johnson spoke to the nation. It's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. First time an American president recorded the words of the theme song of the movement. I was in the hospital from Sunday until about an hour ago. I don't know whether I will be able to participate in the march today, but it is my feeling that people all over this country, but particularly the people right here in Alabama, right here in Selma, should continue the march toward Montgomery. Oh, I want to meet my old lady. This All way. right, how you doing, young lady? Fine, good hey, man, I appreciate everything you do, Thank you. man. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. How you doing? Fine, good to see you. you. Wasn't surprised. Good to see you. You're my hero. Well, thank you, brother. Fine, I just want to you. thank you for all your service. Thank you. For all these years. We really look up to you. What is it like walking through an airport with him? Tedious. <laughs> how you doing? Fine, good to see you. Okay. I'm fine. Something that might take 30 minutes could take an hour and 30 minutes. Hello, how you doing this morning? Nice to meet you. Good Thank to meet you. you. I, I've had to impersonate John a number of times. Yeah. And the reason is, is that you, you have, I have a whole family to come up. <laughs> and they're saying, Johnny, this is John Lewis. And I'm like, I don't want to embarrass the parents. I don't want to, so I've gotten a lot of pictures taken where people just assume that I was John Lewis. But you know what? I am so glad that they mistake me for a great man. Now we'd like to introduce our lovely panelists and kick off our discussion. First is Don Porter, the director of John Lewis Good Trouble, who is an award-winning documentary filmmaker whose work has appeared on national and global platforms, including HBO, PBS, Discovery, and Netflix. She's been commissioned to create films for the Center for Investigative Reporting, Time and Essence magazines, The New York Times, and Amazon. Her current projects include the documentaries Vernon Jordan, Make It Plain, John Lewis, Good Trouble, and The Way I See It. Hi, Don. Hello. Next is Erica Alexander, our co-producer on the film. Erica is an actress, trailblazing activist, entrepreneur, creator, producer, and director, an all-around boss. As co-founder of Color Farm Media and board member of Vote Run Lead, Alexander is on a mission to bring greater equity, inclusion, and diverse representation to media technology and electoral politics. Hi, Erica. Hello. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Next is Latasha Brown. Latapa is an award-winning organizer, philanthropic consultant, political strategist, and jazz singer with over 20 years of experience working in the nonprofit and philanthropy sectors. She is the co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund, a power-building Southern-based civic engagement organization that we've worked closely with on the Good Trouble campaign. Hi, Latasha. Hi, I'm happy to be here. So thrilled to have all three of you here. The first question is for Dawn. What inspired you to make this film and what did you learn about the congressman through the process of making it? Um, first of all, thank you all for having me. Um, if there's any place that I'd wanna be, it's with uh, the, the, the CBC. So um, thank you so much for celebrating this film with us. Um, you know, I had made this series about Bobby Kennedy and Congressman Lewis was the star of the series. He told a story about organizing a rally for Bobby Kennedy's run for president. And it happened on the day 
that Dr. King was assassinated. And it was John Lewis's, through John Lewis's urging that Bobby Kennedy spoke to the audience, the black audience in Indianapolis that day, um, gave one of his finest speeches. Uh, and Indianapolis was a, a city of calm that evening. And when I heard the, the congressman tell that story, I thought, how many more stories are there about John Lewis that we don't know? Um, so CNN came to me and uh, asked if I would be interested in, you know, taking on this this film. And I just leapt at the chance to to chronicle and and you know, relive the life of one of our great American uh, heroes. And what did you learn about him through the process of making the film that surprised you? Um, well, I'm not sure if it was, it wasn't so much of a surprise as it was a, a deeply felt feeling that I got after making this film. Um, you know, I knew very much about the congressman's public life, about his ferocious, you know, about how he was such a warrior for justice, but I didn't know as much about him as a person. And what I found was a very peaceful, um, you know, quiet person who, you know, loved art and music and fun and food and loved to tell a good joke, impeccable sense of timing. Um, but I think the most, I guess, surprising thing is how optimistic the congressman remained, even in such, you know, dark and trying political and economic and social times. He really believed in the spirit of America, the promise of America, and he just would not be deterred um, from that optimism. And it really impacted me, it really affected me, it really made me um, think about, you know, kind of my own attitude. Um, and a little bit of attitude adjustment can go a really, really long way. So I was surprised um, at how optimistic and really happy <laughs> the congressman was um, given so many troubles that he had seen and continued to see. And one more follow-up for you, John. How do you think the time we're living in, including the passing of the congressman, has affected how people are receiving the film? Um, you know, that's a great question. I know we finished the film before he was uh, diagnosed with cancer, before, certainly before the pandemic, before George Floyd's murder, before protests in the streets. And when we finished it, um, you know, we had a lot of pride in this movie and in the, the accomplishment. But having it released um, at a time when, you know, he got to see it. Um, I was able to fly and take the movie to him and show it to him on Valentine's Day. When he saw it, he kept saying, it's powerful. It's so powerful. And, you know, I said, your congressman, your life is powerful. But then in the coming weeks, as, you know, we saw protests in the streets, um, the film really took on a different urgency and poignance um, because the congressman was just so urgently um, asking people, you know, everything he had asked people to, to do in his entire life. Really what he said, you know, his famous line is, if you see something that's not fair, not right, not just do something, say something, get in the way, get in trouble, good trouble. And, uh, you know, he got to see before he passed people not only in all 50 states in America, but around the world, taking to the streets and saying, this is not acceptable. We cannot uh, have black and brown bodies be treated this way. So I, I know that the film is received um, in that spirit and then in that context. And I do feel like there has been a shift um, in the, you know, in the number of people who are not willing to tolerate discrimination and unequal treatment. Absolutely. Erica, how is Congressman Lewis's legacy of fighting for voting rights still relevant today? Well, it's relevant because we're right in the middle of <laughs> this crazy election. Um, I think that Congressman Lewis showed us uh, that what he was willing to put his life on the line for. And he knew that being or having the vote was the most powerful thing you could give a citizen. And so here we are running our leg of the race. And I'm always saying that democracy is a moving target. Everybody can see it now. We inherit a version 
of a democracy it's given to us, but we have to recreate it, a new model. And that's how we do it. We do it by the vote. And so if he was willing to put his life on the line um, to make sure that we were all afforded that opportunity, and we're seeing now how important that is because we are all in this existential, um, you know, psychological um, test that we're in, then, then, it, then it matters. But I think if we want a healthy democracy, then we have to earn it and we have to do something. And, that, and the vote is the beginning of that something. Absolutely. And so thinking about the film and in the ways in which they cover um, so carefully the ways in which voter suppression tactics were used in the 1960s, we think about guessing the amount of jellies in a can or all of the ways in which um, voter suppression was, was prevalent at that time. How have we seen voter suppression tactics used this election cycle? And what can we do to help communities prepare ahead of November? Well, we see it when they start taking post office boxes off the streets and start to destroy machines and postal service and shorten the census time and all the really um, devious and unfortunate actions that are happening. Um, it's, it's, it's not, they're not being undercover about it. It's, it's just how it is. But um, we all have skin in this game. I mean, it really does matter. So I think that he'd be thrilled to see that there are a lot of protests on the street. There's a lot of, um, new organizations being supported. They've always been there and they've always needed to be supported. But um, that blueprint he gave us is not something that just stands still. We have to actually follow it. And there's a new generation out there that are doing that work. Um, um, uh, Dawn always talks about it and she gives them a lot of props to say that uh, Black Lives Matter is the new freedom riders. They, they um, are people who are, who are being trained and they're not just popping up, they're making these things happen, these nonviolent peaceful protests. But we see how they're also being uh, placed inside of a, um, a context of being terrorists. And that's not unlike what they had to deal with back in his day. So I think we really have to work hard to maintain these conditions for not only freedom, freedom and justice, but also to have our voice is heard and voting is that voice and John Lewis was its guardian and we must we must now do the work. We, this is our leg of the race. Erica, you're absolutely right. I'd actually love to hear Don and Latasha, how have you seen voter suppression tactics use this election cycle? You know, uh, we were filming with the congressman all during, uh, you know, 2018 and particularly during the 2018 uh, election when he was campaigning for others. And he expressed a real um, concern about um, voter suppression. And what we learned is that there were more than 300,000 uh, voters in Georgia who were removed, were purged from the voting rolls. And now two years later, we, the reporting determined that 200,000 of those 300,000 purged voters were improperly removed. It is too late to cure you know, that error. And I'm being kind and calling it an error. Um, and you know, when we also think Stacey Abrams lost the election by 73,000 votes. So uh, that was a significant um, situation in Georgia, literally could have changed the state of politics. Um, and that is exactly the kind of interference with the franchise that the congressman warned about and was worried about and actually introduced legislation to prevent from happening again. So we all do really do need to keep our eyes on that prize. Uh, the only you know, kind of hoax happening around voting is that they're, uh, you know, is that no one's in trying to interfere. Absolutely, and I think that what has been really exciting as part of the film and the campaign that we produced alongside of it um, has been working with organizations like Black Voters Matter that is actively trying to um, address voter suppression, most particularly in the Black community and particularly ahead of November's election. 
You know, it's a spectrum. I tell people there's a spectrum of, of voter suppression. We can talk about from voter registration, how people are dropped from the rolls. We know here in Georgia, there were over 200,000 people who were eligible voters in 2018 that were dro dropped from the rolls, right? And Brian Kemp, who at the time was the Secretary of State, is actually the governor now. And so he needs to be held accountable. We saw that. We saw these uh, uh, with exact match where there are many people who tried to, who registered to vote that if they did not sign their name exactly like it was on a registration card that they would be dropped. We've also seen it in the closing of polling sites. One of the places that we worked, we worked in Kentucky and where in Louisville, Kentucky and Jefferson County, where the majority, over 50% of the black population for the entire state lived in that county, that it went from 307 polling sites for 612,000 people to one polling site one polling site you know we can also go from we can also go from going on election day and you go into black communities and there's a three hour like i had to wait um an hours long wait where there's not enough machine course all of those things right but the, fundamentally what i think is the greatest threat is this notion of creating this culture of fear if this fear and terror and confusion that has always been a tactic that's been used in our community we can even go back to post reconstruction right after reconstruction when black people when when formerly enslaved folks actually participated guess what they were able to gain so much ground that in states like mississippi overnight they elected 300 black people however there were white mobs that got together within the course of a week and of those 300 newly elected black people 70 of them were murdered by these mobs. I'm raising this because terror and confusion and fear has always been a voter suppression tactic. And so when we're hearing the, the when we're hearing Trump or we're hearing Republicans saying that we're going to prosecute or the mail or the, all of those elements, those are a part that come right out of that racist book of voter suppression that says we want you to fear this process because we in fact fear you. We fear your power. And so what we have to do is at this moment, we don't pull back, we lean in it. You know, I know that a lot of folks, and I love the phrase, you know, uh, that that uh, First Lady Michelle Obama said, you know, when they go low, we go high. I think that that is so noble, right? I will say uh, as someone on the ground, what we say is when they go low, we go to the polls. When they go low, we go hard. And so fundamentally, what you have to do is almost like when we're protecting our communities, it is one thing when you are literally, when my family, when I feel my family um, is in danger, when I feel my community is in danger, that's when I'm going to actually work harder. I'm not going to pull back. I'm going to work harder. And so I think in this moment when we're looking at voter suppression, we, as we go forward, we've got to hold all of those folks accountable. And this election and elections to come, right, that have literally created barriers for our community. What does that mean? We've got to take them out of office. We've got to put pressure on them. We have to demand that they come under investigation. In the meantime, what we have to do is the way, the best way to be voter protect, uh, voter suppression is for us to come out in record numbers. We've seen that. Those of us that live in the deep South, voter suppression is not a new occurrence to us. We have always had to out-organize our, our opponent. We've always had to out-strategize our opponent. If you look at what John Lewis and others did in Selma, Alabama, that was good organizing and connecting, making sure that the community used its collective power to push back and make change. And it worked. And so that strategy, just as it worked in 1965, it will too work in 2020. We always say at Black Voters Matter, when we work together, we win. We have to recognize that when we work together, we win. So collectively, I think the best way that we can actually fight and push up against voter suppression is that we have to take those folks out of office who have been adamant about putting barriers up to our right to vote. And so that means this election cycle, we have the opportunity to send a strong message that if you mess with our vote, not only we're going to pull back, we're going to come back harder, stronger, and we're going to hold you accountable. Um, as we saw in the first clip of Congressman Lewis after the march in Selma, his journey in the voting rights movement began when he was a young man. Latasha, how is Black Voters Matter engaging with young voters this election cycle? 
So one of the things that makes us most excited about this election cycle is the possibilities and the potential of young people. You know, in the last few months, we have seen the largest uprising in all 50 states in this country, ever in the history of this country, that was mostly led by young people. And so we know there's a tremendous amount of energy and interest that's there. And so while there's a lot of critique around young people being disengaged and not caring about the process, the fact of the matter is young people have finally actually eclipsed the baby boomers, that the baby boomers were the largest population, voting population in this country. Now, young folks under the age of 30 actually make the majority of, um, under 35, make the majority of the voting base. And so when we're looking at that, we have no choice but to really be able to engage young people, but to give them the tools and, and support their leadership. And so in Black Voters Matter, we're doing that in a number of ways. One, we're actually hiring young people to run a lot of the state work that we're leading. Many of our state coordinators are young folks that are under the age of 30 that are leading, working with groups, doing the organizing work, setting our state plans. In addition to that, we're supporting grassroots groups. Many of the grassroots groups that we're supporting also have been founded or created or led by young people. So we're actually investing in the work that young people are doing. And then one of the things that we're doing is also providing some programs that's very targeted to that constituency base. So we're doing a hip hop summit on September the 22nd, where we give the opportunity, we've got scholar activists, we have um, rappers, we've got artists that are actually gonna be a part of that conversation and really talk about voter suppression, but it's specifically to a, a younger audience. And so we're doing a number of activities and events, but also creating a leadership pipeline and investing in the leadership of young people. That's a lot of the work that we're doing. That makes complete sense. And I think as part of the Make Good Trouble campaign that we've been working on alongside the film, something that we've been really interested in learning more about is how we can particularly educate younger audiences about voter suppression and help arm communities of color, particularly the Black community in the South, with the right tools to be prepared ahead of Election Day. So what is the work that Black Voters Matter is doing to prepare our community ahead of Election Day? So. Thank you for asking. You know, we do a lot of things around, we, because of COVID-19, we can't go door to door like we normally would go in an election year, but we have been being creative. So we are doing caravans. We're doing voter outreach caravans in all 11 states. We're actually doing it in a total of about 15 states, but we've got caravans where we're going through neighborhoods. We call, we've got the Blackest Bus in America and the Blackest Bus in America has had baby buses. So we've got baby buses that are traveling throughout Black communities led by organizations that are host groups that are some of our partners, that we're blowing the horns, we're creating excitement around the election, but we're also using technology. So we have QR codes that are placed on our magnets and QR codes that are actually placed on the wrap of the, of the buses and the baby bus so that people can actually just hold up their cell phone, take a picture, or even just um, frame it up. And guess what? They can get a link to check their voter registration status and be able to register to vote if they're not registered already. So we're actually using technology as a tool. The other thing that we're doing is we believe that in this process, it's, it's such a stressful moment that we always have to incorporate Black joy. So we use music. We actually have events online that we engage our um, engage our base in. We're doing a HBCU tour. We have, In two weeks, we're doing a big HBCU tour in North Carolina so that we have young people that we're supporting that are leading the charge, but they're also having a discussion about more than politics. What they're talking about is they're talking about power. And so I also think that the way we frame of voting, we have to shift that. We can't just talk to young folks around, oh, you got to vote because it's your responsibility and people died for you. They know that. Fundamentally, what they're really interested in it is what I call the Janet Jackson principle. What have you done for me lately? And I think that's a valid question. Not only is it a valid question, but I think that is the very thing that ignites young leadership to hold our polit political and elected leadership accountable. And we need that. And so what we've been doing is as we're talking to folks, we're not talking about voting just as a participatory activity. 
we talk about voting from the perspective of power and young people are interested in that. They understand that. And I think the more that we're centering the conversation differently, that it's not about the candidates or political parties, but it really is about fundamentally, how do we tap in and build more power for our communities so that we can one, reduce the harm. We can also put people in pl place and position that are more aligned with our agenda and we can start shaping the public policy that impacts our community. So while we know that the injustices and unrest that we've seen this year are not new, we have certainly seen unprecedented levels of support for Black Lives Matter. I think one of the most inspirational moments of the year was seeing the congressman at the Black Lives Matter Plaza in DC. And Dawn, I know that you spoke a little bit more about the momentum that we've seen around the film and around the movement since the protests after the unjust killing of George Floyd. So from your perspective, does this moment feel different than what we've seen in the past? It does feel different, um, particularly uh, from our most recent past. I, I think I've seen more people asking themselves hard questions, asking how they could not just stand as allies, but in solidarity. You have to, you know, people are accepting the challenge. You either are an active anti-racist or you are part of the problem. This, this is a fairly binary choice. And I, I think, we have seen, um, you know, people in not just all 50 of our states, but uh, all around the world in massive numbers come out and demand better of humanity. Um, I can tell you that uh, it is no accident that the congressman made uh, really a heroic effort to make sure that he visited the mural, the uh, art installation in support of, of the movement for Black Lives. And, uh, you know, I'm asked all the time how he felt about Black Lives Matter. I could never presume to speak for the congressman, but I know that he was uh, enormously proud of the peaceful, insistent um, and energetic young leadership of people working with the Movement for Black Lives. And that is why he wanted that to be the last time that he would be uh, seen in a widespread you know, public forum. So that picture that you refer to, that's you know, yet another in the series of mic drops that the Congressman gave us. Um, he put a smile on everyone's face in the last uh, days and weeks of his life. And it's something that um, is in character for him and something I'm, I'm very grateful for. It's really energizing and inspiring to me. Absolutely one of the most energizing and inspiring moments that we were lucky enough to get, um, particularly as we've been living through uh, the evolving year of 2020. Um, but I think also in thinking about that, one of the most interesting parts of the film was seeing the congressman transition from activist to elected official. Uh, Latasha, do you think more of today's activists will move from the streets into public office? I certainly hope so. I hope that this is a moment that people are really energized and they're being reflective on how if democracy is to be so, we have to make it be so. And so we need young, energetic, progressive, visionary leadership that is in office. What I think happened with Congressman John Lewis, and I, I mean, I've actually heard him say that. I don't think it was ever his intention that I'm going to grow up and be a congressman. What he wanted, and he's been consistent about it, and people who knew him, including his family, said that, that he always wanted to be a servant that he always wanted to serve others. He always had a deep sense of how to affect change and a deep sense that we could do something about injustice. And so when I think about that, when I think about the young people who literally put their lives on the line, going out in the streets and organizing and protesting, I think that that's the kind of courageous leadership that we need. And so I do believe that in every time that there's a, a major movement or major action, people are politicized. You know, that is a turning point for many folks in this country, when you go through and listen to history and how people got involved, many of them got involved because there was a movement already happening and they saw themselves really being able to add something. And so I'm hoping that is going to happen now, that in us in being in this particular political moment that we find ourselves being in where we're dealing with COVID-19, where we're dealing with the, COVID, the pandemic of what I believe is the unraveling of democracy, I am hoping and I believe that there are some young people who have literally understand that to have a robust democracy, that we need protests, that we need activists, that
that we need those who are willing to serve in public office. And we need people to serve in public office that are really representative of the people, that are working people, that are representative working people, that are rec representative of those communities that have been left out. And so I am very, very hopeful that there will be young people that will actually step up in a space of leadership. And so I think, I anticipate that over the next few years, what you will see is you will see more women run for office, you will see more people of color running for office, and you will see more young people running for office. And that actually gives me a lot of hope. So we're one month out from the 2020 election, and we know that John Lewis always said voting was the most powerful nonviolent tool we have to affect change. What advice would you all give to our audience who might need a bit of guidance on how to show up and make the most of the last month before the election? Yeah, I think we've, um, there are serious concerns about whether your right to vote and your ability to vote will be interfered with. And so um, this is not the year to procrastinate. I think if you have the opportunity to vote early, you should do that. Um, there are so many variables that could stand in your way on the day of. A lot of people have moved locations. They may uh, need to mail in vote for health reasons. Um, or just to be cautious. So um, first thing, find your polling place. Hang up, stop this video right this second and find your polling place. Um, you know, because uh, I, I saw, I was filming in 2016 in Ohio and I cannot tell you the number of people I came who had always voted in one place and showed up on election day only to find out that their polling place had been changed. They had to get to work. They didn't have time and they couldn't vote. Ohio was another battleground state that was really hotly contested election. So please look up in advance where your polling place is. Vote by mail if you can vote really early and find out if there are any requirements um, that might, uh, you know, jeopardize your ability to exercise your voice. So we really need everyone to turn up this year. Um, it's literally a, a life or death situation about who leads this country going forward. And, uh, you know, the last thing I would say is uh, politics are not just about the top of the ticket. The people who are elected sheriff determine policing procedures. People who are where there are elected prosecutors, they determine uh, charging. Uh, there are so many other down ballot races that affect your life. School board determines how your children are educated. So do yourself a favor and give yourself an hour just to read up on ballot questions and who is actually on the on the on the ballot. It's not just enough to show up. We've got to vote wisely and in, in our own best interest. First, you got to show up. You have to do something. I think it's wonderful if you can become a poll worker. That's great. Phone bank, donate. Uh, there's many ways you can educate or you could demonstrate to people how to do this. Um, certainly support the local organizations that are on the ground. Um, go to makegoodtrouble.com and find out how you can uh, find out whether you're registered and teach other people to find out. Um, what organizations were doing work in their area. Um, we're going to have probably broken machines and long lines, uh, people being denied that they're registered, like Dawn says. So you got to bring your ID, you got to ID, bring your ID, you got to, in some places, uh, bring water, you know, um, an empty bottle to relieve yourself. <laughs> I mean, you might be in that line a long time, a power bar, an umbrella. Uh, bring an extra chain, uh, sorry, extra charger for your phone. We don't think about those things. Think about it like a tailgate party, you know, um, you know, get all geared up, get a blanket and a mask and stay in line. Don't get out of line. Be ready for the long haul. Make sure that you stay in line and that is your polling place. So, you know, get prepared. And um, I think that you'll, that you'll do good. But I think if we look at it that way, we'll have the right attitude going in. And you got to know your rights, by the way. Please know your rights because uh, you you got to make a plan. If you don't know your rights, somebody can tell you something and discourage you. And if you can, vote early. Please vote early. You know, I think we have to recognize what time it is. You know, it's really, that's my phrase. What time is it? It is time literally for us to stand in our power. That fundamentally we are making a choice that, that this country is either going to go backwards or forward. And if it is to go forward, we're going to have to make it be so. And so we're not in a position that we can actually just talk and philosophize about 
who we need, what should happen. Right now, we've got to work all hands on deck that we are sub- we are in a particular situation where our community communities need us. And so I always tell people, we can't leave any power on the table. So right now, we've got one solid month. It is time to grind. And so I hope that everybody that's listening to this discussion actually feels compelled to not just say that they're going to vote and commit to vote themselves, but right now you have officially been deputized by Black Voters Matter. We need you to find five friends, the five friends pledge. You are should be responsible for making sure that there are five people, whether it's in your family, whether it's friends, whether it's co-workers, but really be able to make sure that you get them to vote, that you call, that you use everything in your power, right, to really get people to participate in this process. Democracy, the way that democracy works, it works best when we are a part of the process, when we hold people accountable that cause harm and pain to us, when we literally say, no, this is enough. Our community will not be another political pundit punching bag, right? Our community will not continue to take the brunt you know, of what is happening when the economy goes, when anything happens in this country, our community disproportionately is impacted. And so I think we have to really be adamant this time that it's not just about this election, it's not just about candidates, it is in fact about us. And so we have to treat it that way. We have to treat it just as our lives depend on it. And no, voting will not solve every problem. John Lewis would have would have said that, right? But it is certainly a leverage of power. And whenever our communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, where we're looking at an age where we're saying that 50% of Black small businesses may not even make it because of COVID-19, when there is a current government that passed out billions of dollars and less than eight than more than 80 percent of black businesses did not get a dime of that stimulus package we got to hold some people accountable and in order for us to hold folks accountable we have to exercise our right we have to vote and we've got to bring our families our households our friends our co-workers along this is the moment we've got to know what time it is and what time it is it is time for us to show up to stand in our power, to be unapologetic and standing in our power, to look out for our communities and to fight for what we rightfully deserve. That concludes our panel conversation. Thank you so much to Dawn, Erica and Latasha for joining us today. Before we officially conclude, I wanted to share one upcoming project that our team is incredibly excited about and is particularly relevant to today's discussion. In partnership with Warner Brothers, Macro, and Braun Creative, we helped co-finance the recently announced Judas and the Black Messiah, a new drama produced by Ryan Coogler, Charles D. King, and Shaka King, directed by Shaka King and based on the heroic life of Fred Hampton, the Black Panther activist who was assassinated by the FBI at just 21 years old. The film is based on Hampton's revolutionary rise in the late 1960s and his tragic downfall after being portrayed by informant William O'Neill. Today, we're happy to share a trailer of the films, which will be released next year. Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois Black Panther Party. Repeat after me. Looking at 18 months for the stolen car, five years for impersonating a federal officer, or you can go home. The Black Panthers are forming a rainbow coalition of oppressed brothers and sisters of every color. Their aim is to sow hatred and inspire terror. I will learn all that I can. I will learn all These ain't no terrorists. You can murder a liberator, but you can't murder a liberation. You can murder a revolutionary, but you can't murder a revolution. And you can murder a freedom fighter, but you can't murder a freedom.
We're excited to share more about the film in the coming months, so please look out for announcements. Thank you again to our panelists, and we hope you join us in making some good trouble and supporting our impact work. To learn more, you can visit participantsvote.com and makegoodtrouble.com. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.